Good afternoon. I'm Caitlin Youngquist with the University of Wyoming Extension and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about soil testing for gardens. Soil testing can be a very useful tool uh, for gardeners and hopefully I'll be able to share with you some information today that will make it easier and um, more useful for you. One thing to keep in mind it, when we're talking about soil, there are a lot of different factors. Uh, chemistry is an important part of managing soil, biology, and physics. And when it comes to soil testing, what we're specifically talking about is the chemistry of the soil. So we're looking at the pH or the acidity, the salt content, your macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and the micronutrients. When it comes to biology, what we're looking at is the nutrient availability for the plants, uh, crop condition, the, the microorganisms living in the soil, we're looking at bacteria and fungi, earthworms, the organic carbon content of the soil, which is what feeds the soil biology, disease pressure, there are a lot of different factors we look at with uh, soil biology. I'm not going to talk about that much today, but there is a different set of tests that can be done to look specifically at the biological condition of your soil. But the best thing to do really there is to look at crop condition, are the plants healthy, and are there earthworms in your garden? Those are the two most important things really as gardeners that you can look at. And when it comes to physics, we look at things like erosion and compaction, um, how and the water infiltration, how does the water move through the soil? Does it puddle on top of the soil? Does the soil dry out very quickly? And then tilth, the workability of the soil. Um, does it just look and feel like really healthy soil? So these are all different factors we look at when managing soil. There's different ways and different tools and methodologies to test for a lot of these different factors. But today we're going to talk about specifically the chemistry of the soil. And that's what a soil um, nutrient test will show you. It's greatly impacted by fertilizer and water. And the way we have an impact on soil physics, or the physical condition of the soil, is through disturbance and bare soil primarily, so tillage and leaving our soil bare. And then the way we improve or impact the biology of the soil is through plant roots, keeping living plant roots in the soil as long as possible, and adding amendments like manure and compost, organic materials to the soil. And when we have all three of these things balanced, the biology, chemistry, and physics of the soil, we have a really healthy, functioning, high-functioning system. So keep in mind when you're managing a soil to keep all of these factors in mind. Today we're just going to talk about chemistry. So why might you soil test as a gardener? There are a few different reasons. The primarily will be to identify problems. So if something in your garden is struggling, there are certain crops you can't grow well, um, everything is struggling, you're trying to figure out why, and a soil test can really help identify those challenges. It can also be helpful to establish a baseline. Maybe you're putting in a new garden and you want to see where your baseline in your soil is. Maybe you're looking at changing some of your practices. You're going to change from a rototilled garden to a no-till garden and you want to get a baseline on where your organic matter is. You may be going to spend a lot of money on fertilizer. Maybe you have a very large garden and you're going to invest a lot of money on fertilizer, or compost, or manure, and you want to know what your soil um, nutrient status is before you spend that money. Maybe you're just curious. Maybe you just really find soil chemistry fascinating and you would just like to know what the chemistry of your soil is like. You can also test the nutrient content and the salt content of manure and compost. Uh, it's very similar. You use the same labs. They're similar reports, but it can be very useful if you're going to add a large quantity of compost or manure to your garden or to your small farm, and then you can test the nutrient content of that amendment. So soil chemistry tests, what will the lab test for? Right? You can select a variety of tests from any different soil lab, but here are some of the basics. Nitrate nitrogen, so you're going to be testing for nitrogen, but it comes in many forms. It comes in a nitrate ion, it comes as an ammonium ion, and it also comes in the organic form. So what the soil is going to, soil labs are going to test for primarily is nitrate nitrogen, ammonia nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, those are your big three, your macronutrients. Then some of your micronutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, they can be lumped in as macro or micro, they're kind of in the middle. And then some of your micronutrients, zinc, iron, manganese, copper, boron, um, there are a variety of others, but those can be also helpful for identifying where your what the nutrient status of your soil is. Also, you'll get a test for soil organic matter. They use a, a very, very high temperatures. Basically, they burn off the organic matter and then look at the difference in the soil. So that can be very useful for monitoring over time. Uh, pH, or the acidity of the soil, and salts, also very useful, especially here in Wyoming, where we have a lot of very alkaline and very saline soils. 
And then the EC, which is your total dissolved salt, so so that's the that EC stands for electrolytic conductivity, and that is what you'll see on your lab report typically is either total salts or EC, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a few minutes. And then your sodium adsorption adsorption ratio, or your your the percent of the exchange sites in the soil that are occupied by sodium, and that identifies the sodium hazard in your soil or your water, and there are many different um, ions that form salts in soil and in water. Sodium is particularly problematic and can be very difficult to manage because of its large ionic size. So if you are concerned that you have sodium issues in your soil, the getting tested, the sodium absorption ratio can be very helpful. This is a list of our primary plant nutrients. You can see at the top your macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. This list includes calcium, magnesium, and sulfur also as macronutrients. And then it gets into all your micronutrients here down the list. And what's interesting is this is just a reminder about the, why they're called macro and micronutrients. The relative number of atoms in plants, right? So for any plant, every plant, for every one million atoms of nitrogen, you might have one of molybdenum or nickel, so that's why these are called micronutrients. You do, the plants just need a lot less of them compared to the macronutrients. And this is also interesting because it shows you the primary form of plant uptake. So for nitrogen, plants primarily take up the nitrate and the ammonium ion. For phosphorus, they take up phosphate. And for potassium, calcium, and magnesium, they take up the pure ionic form. For sulfur, they take it up in a sulfate form and down the list. So that's just kind of interesting thing to see what the plants use. And then where these nutrients come from. Organic matter is a big one. And then minerals, um, as the minerals are weathered in the soil and they start to break down slowly through biological and chem um, chemical processes, they release nutrients into the soil that the plants can use into the soil solution. So this just is a good example of all the different um, essential plant nutrients that, that come from the soil. Of course, the oxygen um, or the carbon and the hydrogen come from the water and the air. So just interesting things to look at here. This is the nitrogen cycle, and the reason I wanted to share this is just an example of of how all of these nutrients move through the soil and go from um, the plant to the soil to through the through the microorganisms in the soil back to the plant again. It's a continuous cycle, right? And remember, a lot of nitrogen comes from the organic matter, and what happens is as the organic matter is 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 broken down by organisms in the soil, by the bacteria and fungi, it releases nitrogen in the ammonium and the nitrate form. And this is the primarily the form that the plants can use. Some of that nitrate can be lost through leaching, through excessive water moving through the soil, right? And it's continually going back and forth into organic matter and into microbes and then back into the soil solution so the plants can take it up. That's why when you have a lot of organic matter in your soil, it generally prov provides over time a slow, steady release of nitrogen for the plants to use. This is the phosphorus cycle. There are some key differences here. Notice the small, the pool of organic matter is consi considerably smaller, and there's a little bit of solution phosphorus here, right? And then a lot of it comes from the secondary minerals and compounds. What's particularly key is that this small pool of of phosphorus in the solution that the plants can take up, right, that the plants can use, it very quickly, depending on the soil chemistry, moves over here into these minerals and is not available to plants, the precipitation process here, right, and 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 because of our high pH, our very alkaline and um, saline, high salt soils, but especially because of our alkaline soils, a lot of the phosphorus that might otherwise be available to plants moves over here into these minerals and is unavailable. However, if we have high organic matter in our soils and we really work on building the organic material in our soils, this phosphorus here is more available to the plants. So just something interesting here to keep in mind with the with the phosphorus. So often there'll be phosphorus in the soil, but it is not available to the plants. Interestingly enough, iron is the same here in our soils, and so that's why often we'll see iron deficiencies, even though there's plenty of iron in the soil, it's just not plant available. Manure and compost are great sources of phosphorus. Potassium is very simple. Um, it, there, we tend not to have shortages here in our soils, although occasionally I've seen sort of shortages on farm crops that are grown in heavy sandy or very sandy soils. 
But again, we have a lot of it in solution, means dissolved in the water and the soil, and um, very little of it gets gets um, bound up in the minerals that the plants can't use. And so it's it's a pretty simple story. We rarely have shortages of it, but it is a it's very important nutrient, and it's important to have enough. I mentioned soil pH a few times. That's the alkalinity of our soil. Remember, acid is low numbers. Down here on this chart, it starts at 4 for an acidic pH and up to 10 for an alkaline pH. Neutral is 7, which is where most plants prefer to grow based on nutrient availability. Most of our soils in Wyoming are the high 7s and even up to 8. And what you'll notice here is that um, the nutrient availability is greatly affected by soil pH. So um, as the pH creeps up above 7, uh, we start to see a decrease in the availability of phosphorus and a decrease in the availability of a lot of these other micronutrients, iron, copper, and zinc, for example. It doesn't affect calcium very much. We actually see an increase in the availability of magnesium. Potassium and sulfur aren't greatly affected, nor is nitrogen, but particularly phosphorus and our micronutrients are less plant available as the pH creeps up. Again, increasing the organic matter in the soil will really help with this. And some plants are more tolerant of a high pH than others, right? So uh, those, and there's lists of that that you can get that will help you determine what can thrive in your soils. Blueberries are kind of a classic example that really prefer an acidic soil. They're bog plants typically, so they don't thrive here in Wyoming without a lot of so careful soil management because they really prefer acidic soils. Soil salinity is another challenge we have here in Wyoming. What happens is if you've ever boiled a pot of water on the stove and then what is left behind is a little bit of these white residue and then less the water's boiled off and the salts are left behind, that's what's happening in the soil. And so salt, when it comes to when we're talking about soil salinity, are basically positive and negative ions that dissociate in water. And almost all of those ions, with the exception of sodium, are essential plant nutrients. And so really it's an ex excess amount of nutrients, more than the plants can use. And what happens, particularly when you have bare soil and it's hot, and you may have salt in your water, as the water evaporates off the surface of the soil, the salts remain behind and accumulate, right? And water um, moves upward through capillary action. So this is an important thing to keep in mind, what you'll often see, white crystals on the surface of the soil, that salts that have left, been left behind. Low-lying areas um, it will often have more salts in them, or on the surface of the soil. One of the most important things you can do here is keep your soil mulched. No bare soil in the garden. Make sure everything is really well mulched. That will keep the soil cool and mean less water will evaporate and less salts will be brought up from, from, under, from deeper in the soil. The other thing you can do is grow more salt tolerant plants. University of Wyoming Extension has a great bulletin that lists the salinity tolerance of various horticultural plants. That's a good reference. The other thing you can do if you're really concerned about salty irrigation water is to have your water tested when you have your soil tested. And if you have high saline uh, high salts in your soil, very saline soils, take care with what fertilizers and what manure or compost you add because again you are, have an excess of certain nutrients in your soil so it's important to manage carefully. This is a general classification when you get uh, your soil test results back, you'll get a number for your electrolytic, electrolytic conductivity and your soil pH and potentially your soil adsorption ratio if you have asked for that. And this shows you if you have greater than four of an EC, uh, EC greater than four, you'll have a saline soil and your pH and various things. So these, this is just an example of what you're, what you're looking at here. And again, your, the soil lab that you work with or your local extension office can help you interpret some of these results. Um, so this is your total salt, and this is the ratio of sodium to calcium and magnesium, and that determines your, your sodium problems. So that was a little bit of a chemistry lesson. Now let's talk about how to collect samples for an accurate lab interpretation. So if you do, do not do a good job collecting samples, the lab will um, only be able to give you results that are as accurate as the samples you've collected, right? So um, divide your property into management zones. So you may want to sample your lawn or your garden or your pasture, or maybe you have two different gardens, one in the front of the house and one in the back of the house that have been managed differently over the years. So separate your collect sample collection areas into management zones and leave out any really strange areas. So say you have a one acre garden and one corner of it's always really a little wetter or it's lower or it's always really problematic, Sep sample that separately 
because what you're going to do is collect a variety of or collect samples across the landscape or across the garden and mix them all together for what we call a composite sample. Now if you have some really strange area, um, one section that behaves differently than the others and you mix everything together, you're not going to get accurate results for either section. So separate those out. You need about 10, 10 to 15 samples collected for a garden typically. If you're sampling pastures um, or larger areas, you'll need more samples. But for a garden, typically 10 to 15 cores across the garden will be just fine. If it's a very small garden, you can get away with less. But keep in mind, the more composite sam the more samples you, you take to make your composite, the more accurate your results will be. Use clean tools. Don't use anything that's rusty or galvanized. And you're going to collect your sample down to a depth of about 6 inches for gardens. Remove any bits of root. Um, don't sample where there's manure or anything like that. Try and get a really clean sample. And then lay your samples out to air dry on a clean paper bag or paper towels or something where animals aren't going to get to it or you're not going to spill anything on it and keep everything really clean. These are some tools that you can use. Um, this is a soil probe here on the left and soil augers. It's a very simple tool, but you don't need to go buy one. Often your extension um, local extension office or maybe your conservation district will have one you can borrow but you can also use a shovel so you'll go take your 10 to 15 core samples across the landscape mix them in a clean bucket and then lay them out to dry that's the simplest way to do it most labs ask for about two cups of soil if your sample um, when you're done collecting all your different cores and you mix it together and you have maybe four or five cups of soil mix it together really uniformly and then take out uh, about the two cups that um, the lab requires, and but make sure that that soil is thoroughly mixed so you don't end up with sending a sample into the lab that only accounts for half of your pasture or your garden. If you don't have access to a soil core, a shovel can work really well. Just dig a hole down about six to eight inches and then take a slice off, an inch or two slice off the side of that hole. Then um, you can use that slice. You can actually slice down the middle of this to take a strip of soil that's going to be about this, similar to taking a soil core right down the middle of this shovel, dump it in the bucket, do that 10 more times, mix it all together, and then separate out your two cups. If you do it this way, you're going to end up with a lot more soil than you need, so it's very important to mix it uniformly before you take out your subsample. And there are a lot of videos, if you look, particularly look at extension resources and look up on YouTube some videos on soil sampling, they'll give you some good resources and examples of how to do it. So where do you send your sample? That's the next question. Find a lab that is certified by the North American Proficiency Testing Program. You can go to their website and you can look up different labs. There are several um, in neighboring states. We don't um, have a University of Wyoming lab anymore, but there are several in neighboring states. Colorado State University Extension or the Colorado State University Soil Testing Lab um, is easy to work with as a gardener because if you tell them that you want a garden soil test, their results um, are very easy to interpret and they're designed for gardeners, but they're a little slower. Some of the commercial labs will turn around um, the samples a lot faster and get you results faster, but they may be harder to interpret. So there are many choices. I would suggest going to this website and looking up some different labs in the area. Make sure it's a certified lab. So you get your results back. This is an example of um, the soil test report. I should say though also when you're looking at these labs on their websites they should have sampling um, shipping instructions and how they how much soil they want and where they want it shipped. So if you have any questions you can call the lab directly. This is an example of the result from a soil test that was done by Colorado State University Extension specifically for gardens. Now notice it says native vegetation and the proposed plant type is vegetable garden. So this individual was putting in a new garden now, the other thing to keep in mind is that when you fill out your soil test forms, be as detailed as possible about what was grown there, what you're going to grow, because then they can give you more accurate recommendations if you're asking for a soil test or um, fertilizer recommendation. So in this particular case, they go. this is why the CSU lab is great for, for folks who are less familiar with soil chemistry, because they have very specific recommendations. Uh, pH is high, but native and introduced plant species that are adapted to this pH should not be negatively affected. EC is less than 2, two so your salinity is not a problem. Organic matter, um, the texture estimate even, nitrate, 
Um, they say nitrate here is low, apply, and they give you some recommendations for that. Um, phosphorus, there's your soil test results, and they give you some recommendations on how much to add um, per square foot as opposed to per acre, which is handy for most gardeners. They use, give you some different examples of what types of fertilizer you can use to meet that need. They go through your micronutrients and then um, sometimes put some additional comments here. So this can be a, a really useful resource. They just they sort of provide everything you need here for the interpretation. And again, be very specific about what um, what you're growing so that they can give you accurate recommendations. This is the CSU report that's that's designed for agricultural use. Notice it's um has it's it can it has results for multiple fields. So this particular producer sent in only one um, sample uh, at a time, but you could send in five or six samples and they'd all come back on the same report, maybe five or six different fields that you had. pH, salts, um, texture estimate, that's optional if you ask for it, organic matter percent, and then it goes through all of your, um, in parts per million, all of your different nutrients here. Now, the fertilizer recommendations, this particular producer asked for fertilizer recommendations for oats. And in order to get accurate recommendations, they need to put the proposed crop and the yield per acre goal. So they wanted to grow oats and with a yield goal of 110 bushels per acre. So the soil lab can put this information and the soil information into their formulas and come up with some fertilizer recommendations. They're suggesting 40 pounds per acre of P2O5 and 80 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Now. As a producer, you would know your own field. You may know what you've done in the past, but this gives you a good place to start. This is a different lab. This is Midwest Laboratories. Uh, again, these are the numbers the lab assigns. This is the sample identification that the producer sent, um, that the producer labeled their samples with, so that this means something to them, has something to do with their fields. Organic matter percent and then the different phosphorus. And they have little notes here that says very high, medium, high, um, very low. And that's their little bit of interpretation there that can help you determine how to use these numbers. Cation exchange capacity, this is the ability of the soil to exchange nutrients. Um, their nitrate is down here. You can also do depth. So sometimes you'll sample 0 to 6 inches and then 6 to 12 inches, depending on what you're doing. But again, these are more detailed reports. So just another example of what might come back from the lab for you to look at. This is another interesting thing you can do at home. This is um, this little infographic says it's how to identify your soil type, but that's actually inaccurate. What you are really identifying here is your soil texture, your percent of sand, silt, and clay. So this can be an easy thing to do at home, do it with the kids. It's kind of interesting. It can help you look at some of the different um, characteristics of your soil mix the water in the jar with the soil and let it sit for a day or two and it settles out into sand, silt, and clay and organic matter kind of floats on the top and then you're able to see what the soil textural differences are in your soil. So I, I think it's important to touch briefly on the difference between a fertilizer and a soil amendment when it comes to identifying the needs in your soil. So a fertilizer, when you're applying a fertilizer, it's a source of very specific nutrients, rapid release and availability. Generally, it has your macro, it's labeled with your macronutrients. You'll see numbers there, a 10, 10, 10, or something that says 10% uh, nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% potassium. So it tells you what's in it. Uh, it can be synthetic or organic. Um, and some manure, like poultry manure, would, could go into the fertilizer category. But rapid release and availability, it's for use now or within a growing season. A soil amendment is a source of organic matter typically and long-term nutrients and a benefit to soil health. It's a long-term investment. It's going to release nutrients slowly over time. It's going to support the soil biology and it's going to increase your soil health over time. Compost or aged manure and cover crops are examples of this. So for example, miracle Grow plant food, that's an example of a fertilizer, see the number here, all-sort purpose plant food 24816, that means it's 24% nitrogen, 8% P2O5, and 16% uh, K2O or potash, right? And you can look down here, it has it has the breakdown of what that is, right? And then you'll notice that there, there are slightly different blends based on all purpose. This plant food um, or the rose plant food is slightly different, right? So that's when you know it's a fertilizer, right? And it tells you what it's made of. These are synthetic fertilizers here on the label. It tells you what's in it. These are examples of soil amendments. So composted manure, look at the very low nutrient content per weight based on compared to the fertilizer, 0.05%. Um, 
right? As opposed to here, we're looking at like 24% nitrogen. So again, a nutrient-rich blend promotes root growth and improves soil quality over time, long-term investment in soil health. Very important over the long term. Um, uh, grass clippings and leaves, you can compost that at home. Food waste, this is a worm bin that I keep at the office. Worm castings are great for the soil. So think about you're going to have less short-term nutrient benefit, long, more long-term slow-release nutrients and benefit of soil health. So how do we interpret our results? Now we understand the chemistry. We've talked a little bit about biology. We get these lab results in front of us. What do we do with those? These are two of the best bulletins that I've found for interpreting um, soil test results for gardeners. One is the soil test interpretation guide that comes from Oregon State University. You can look that up. And then Colorado State University has a soil test explanation bulletin that's also very good and simple and to the point. So I would encourage you to look up both of those if you have a soil test you need interpreting and um, speak with the lab that you're working with. They often have interpretation guides available as well. So good luck. Um, and if you um, need assistance or might need to borrow some tools, contact your local extension office and best of luck in the garden.